I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in what I would almost call a, a, a parallel universe. And what I mean by that is I had these sort of two tracks that I lived uh, that had in some ways nothing in common but were very much the same. One track was the academic track. I've, I've, I live in, outside of Chicago in a, in a community called Wheaton, Wheaton, Illinois. There's a college there called Wheaton College that, whose claim to fame is that Billy Graham did his undergraduate studies there. And, um, and, and so I, I grew up in Wheaton and um, I, uh, I, I was always attracted to the college. I didn't go there as an undergrad, but I went there as a, as a graduate student. And I ended up teaching at Wheaton College for 25 years. Um, in fact, I had uh, Rick's uh, younger brother, Adam, in class uh, 20 some years ago. Anyways, um, and, and so I taught at, at Wheaton College, I taught for 25 years. I taught accounting, I taught business law, I taught intercultural education. I taught entrepreneurship, I taught even, I even taught human development, which really meant I know just a little bit more than the students did, <laughs> if you can imagine. That was not my field of expertise, but they needed someone to teach the course and I volunteered to do it. But, but, the, but the parallel to that was, is that I was always interested in, in sort of commerce, you know, business and uh, entrepreneurship. The first job I had was a self-employed job when I was 10 years old. I used to go to the local uh, grocery store and I'd buy 10 sticks of gum in a 10 pack and I would break the gum out and I would go to school and I would sell them for two cents a piece. So I doubled my money. So I pay 10 cents and I got, and I got 10 cents back. And, and from the time I was 10, I've always sort of thought that way. When I, I, I grew up shoveling sidewalks and cutting grass. When I was in high school, I worked in college actually, I worked for a uh, clothing store. And I remember one year they had this, this contest that would give you a, a commission if you could sell a belt uh, you know, like a belt that goes around your waist. And so every person that came in to buy something, I tried to sell them a belt. So they would come in, they'd buy a pair of socks, and I'd say, I got a great belt that'll look great with those socks. And they would, you know, and, and I was the belt salesman of, of Wheaton for, for a while. And, um, and so I've always sort of thought that way. When I got out of the university, you know, I, I worked for an investment banking company that we, uh, for two years and then left that and we started our own investment banking company. I was 23 years old. Thought I knew more than, you know, the 30 and 40 and 50 year olds. Um, and then I quit that and, uh, and did some other things, started some other businesses and wealth management and real estate and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I'm afraid one of my closest friends in the world is Dave Van Dyke sitting back here. He's a psychologist. I'm always afraid he's going to have to take me aside and try to help me understand who I am. I probably need some in-depth counseling. But, but uh, really what I thought of is I reflected on these, so there's these two parallel universes, the sort of one in the academy and one in commercial enterprise, what I realized is that I'm just a curious person. I've always been curious about things, why things are the way they are. And, and, um, and one of those, those sort of things I've been curious about is leadership. So in the sort of academic universe I lived in, when I did my doctoral dissertation, I did it on how do you develop leaders who've experienced totalitarian political systems? And my, my case study was Czech and Slovakia. And so I spent a lot of time for years gathering data. You know, how do you do leadership development if the only leadership models you've seen are totalitarian and repressive and those kinds of things? So I was curious about that. And I ended up doing all my, my academic study in that, that sort of sphere. So, anyway, so that's, my, that's my background. Um, and hopefully I'll share some ideas with you today that will help you. Um, but before we do, let me pray for us and we'll, we'll start. Father, we give you thanks again for this day and for all the days you give us. For every moment uh, is a gift, and we know that gift comes from you. We thank you we can be here and uh, in safety. We know that we are, uh, we're fortunate in that way because we know much of the world is at war. But we're grateful that you give us the chance to be here to learn from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about in the next, you know, 45 minutes or so um, about, about developing leaders. But the thing about leadership that, I, that I've discovered is, is that um, is you think about developing the next generation of leaders or other leaders in your organizations. But the reality is you're developing yourself as a leader all the time. So even today, I want you to sort of think in a, in a dualistic sort of way. Think about how do I develop leaders, but how do I develop myself as a leader? Because the principles are basically the same. So, um, so that's kind of where, we, where we're going to start. So I, 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 googled, uh, I googled leadership. <laughs> and uh, 
I can't read it, but so, so here's what happened. So I Googled leadership and up came 460 million possibilities on Google. And they came up in 0.4 seconds. 460 million in 0.4 seconds. So I did some calculations. If you looked at one, uh, if you looked at, at, at one every minute, 24 hours a day, you could, you could review or read or watch 1,440 articles per day on leadership. Well, at that rate, it would take you 319,444 days to get through all 460 million possibilities. In other words, uh, it would take you 875 years. So th that's how complex, you know, leadership development, leadership studies is, is a bit of a paradox because on one hand it's a simple thing. You know, how do you just get someone from point A to point B? But as you dig deep, and as, as the, the Google God said, there are 460 million different things you can read, write, watch on Google about this topic. So, so you, you never really exhaust the study of, of leadership. And so what I'm gonna to try to do today is, is give you just one small bite of the apple, just one small piece of it. Um, and it's, it's a little bit just sort of based on my own experience and things that I've, I've read and thought about and, and conversations I've had. But if you wanna study leadership, I mean, it, it can be a lifelong kind of pursuit. I'm not suggesting you should do that, but, but it is something that you can, you can think about because it is pretty interesting because it, 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 it crosses you know, ministry and business and psychology and counseling and all these things are all mixed into it together. And so it gets to be really kind of a fun topic to, to study. So what we're gonna do, uh, it's gonna be three parts. Um, like it's like a good three, three part sermon. Um, so the first part I'm gonna talk about a little bit why leadership's important. And then we're gonna make a distinction between managers and leaders or management and leadership. And then um, the last part will be, and it will be the most of it, is the, the sort of the four distinctives that, that cause or help leaders flourish. And I think they're the, the, and actually I would say these are the bedrock of what it means to be an effective leader. These are the four things that uh, you can learn and develop in your own leadership that will cover 90% of the 460 million possibilities that you can read about on, on Google. So with that, um, so. One, of the, uh, one of my favorite authors in this area of leadership is a guy named Max Dupree. Max Dupree lives, or I think he's probably passed away now, he lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he was the president and CEO of a company that built uh, desks for workspaces. These, they were called Steelcase, and they were steel desks that offices all across the United States, all across the world would buy and, and place in their offices. And he wrote a book called The Leadership, leadership is an Art, and he says this, that the first responsibility of every leader is to define reality. And I thought that was interesting. If, if you were here on Saturday night, um, Lars, in the, one of the videos they played, said one of the core convictions of, of ELF is defining reality. I thought that was interesting because I, I, I didn't know that they thought that, to be honest with you, but I thought it was interesting that, that they mentioned that. And, and the reason why, why this is a critical thing to do is this. We live in a jungle, not a zoo. We live in a jungle, not a zoo. And if you don't recognize that and realize that as a leader, you will struggle. I think leaders in general are, are sort of entrepreneurial. They tend to be optimistic. They tend to think the best of people. They get excited. They, they have deep convictions. And, and oftentimes those characteristics can put you in a pseudo reality. And if you're a leader in a pseudo reality, you're in trouble because not only will it cost you your life, but perhaps the lives of others. I think we're seeing this a little bit in uh, what's going on in Ukraine right now. I think that the leader of Russia is living a pseudo reality. He doesn't seem to understand the things that he has brought upon his country. So we live in a jungle, not a zoo. So what does that mean? What are the differences between a jungle and a zoo? Well, a zoo is predictable. I know what time the zoo opens up in the morning. I know where the bathrooms are. I know where the food is. I know where the, all the lion's cages and the bird cages are. I know, I know where everything is very predictable. But if you live in a jungle, it's very unpredictable. You know, lions and tigers or bears are not confined by hours of, of entrance and, and closing. 
Zoos are safe. You know, if you go to a zoo, there's usually, a, you know, especially in the, the well, animals are a little bit more wild, they have moats and they have gates and they have fences that separate you from, from the rest of the, the animals. Um, but the jungle's not, the jungle's dangerous. I don't know if you've spent any time in the jungle, but it's a dangerous place. Uh, zoos are tame. You know, uh, animals in the, in the zoo typically have become almost domesticated. They don't, they don't have the same instincts that an animal that is free in the jungle that are wild. Um, zoos have boundaries. You know, the, the bird cage is in one place and the tiger cage is in another place and the reptile cage is in another place. It's, it's bounded they're, they're in, and those, those animals can't mix. But in the jungle, there are no boundaries. In the zoo, the animal eats off a menu. The zookeeper decides what the tigers will eat. But in, in, in the jungle, the tiger's got to decide what he'll eat. The zoo has a controlled environment, all the temperatures of the reptile cage and the bird cage and the polar bears, you know, that's all controlled by mankind. Whereas in the jungle, control is an illusion. I think leaders sometimes think they can control the outcomes. They can't. They can lead you to a direction, but they can't control. We live in a jungle, not a zoo. And again, and why is that important to understand? Because sometimes the littlest things can kill us. So this is a picture of the golden poison dart frog. It's the smallest reptile in the jungle, and it's the most deadly reptile in the jungle. This, this little animal, this little reptile, um, carries enough toxin, poison, uh, to kill 10 grown men. It's got enough toxin that on the tip of a pin would kill you. He's the smallest thing, smallest species in the jungle, and yet it's the most deadly. And as a leader, uh, some of the smallest things can kill us. We were in our in the leadership um, network a couple days ago. Uh, John Stevens was talking about all of these pastors who have had these failings. And I don't believe for a minute that that the Bill Hybels or the James McDonalds or the Mark Driscolls woke up and said one day, I think I'll be immoral. I think I'll treat my staff poorly today. I think from now on, I'm, I'm going I'm to treat everybody as if they're my production unit. I don't think they did that. I think what happened is that their problems that developed took place over time. You know, that little, just that little 5% that they, that they compromised. But you take that 5% and you extend it out over decades, and all of a sudden it's not this anymore, it's this. And the jungle is out to destroy you. I think the jungle is out to destroy you. And if you make compromises on those little things, eventually they catch up to you. Now, the other side of it, though, is that the small things can actually make a positive difference as well, right? So if I, if I, if I decide I want to uh, walk 10,000 steps a day, at the end of one year, I have 3,650,000 steps. If I decide to read 20 pages a day of a book, over the course of 365 days, I'll read 30 books. You know, if I watch my sugar intake, I probably will gain a lot of weight, you know, over the course of 365 days. So, so the little things matter. And, and, and if you don't watch the little things, they'll kill you. One of the greatest lessons I ever learned in my life, I can, I can remember this so vividly, I was, I was probably 10 or 11 years old and, and we went to the store, my dad bought something. At that time he paid everything with cash, right? Now they, they, don't, even, they don't even take cash anymore. But, um, but the, the, the woman behind the uh, cash machine said, oh, you gave me too much money. Or no, she, no my, he, he, she gave the return, my dad paid for it, she gave the money to my dad and he looked at it and said, well, this is not right, you paid me, you gave me more than I deserve back. And so he returned that money back to the cashier. And as a 10-year-old boy, I'm thinking, well, my first thought, why, why don't you keep it? She made the mistake, not you. But as I learned and, and thought about this, I realized that my dad was teaching me a lesson. It's the little things in life that matter. Because if, if I watch him compromise on that, then I begin to compromise. And if I compromise on this, then it's the next thing, and it's the next thing. And all of a sudden, I'm a thief landing in prison because I compromised on the little things. And eventually those little things add up. 
So that's just my introduction to leadership. So let's, let's go to this question here. Manager or leader, which are you? It's a, it's a really basic question, but it again has complexities that, that I'd like to just dig in for just a little bit before we get into these the characteristics that make someone an effective leader. And, and this is not to say that one is more important than the other. If you had an organization of all leaders, you'd have nothing but chaos, right? You'd have everybody telling everybody else what they ought to be doing. If you had an organization of all managers, nothing would ever get done because they'd all be managing each other. So we need to make a distinction between the two, but it's not a value judgment. It's merely just to say these are two different ways of, or styles of, of, of being in an organization. Let's work with a couple of definitions first. So what is management? Management, this is, a, I'll give you the definition and I'll explain it. So management is the scientific art of attaining intended organizational objectives by working effectively with and through human and material resources. Essentially what that means is they just make, make sure that the right things happen at the right time. That's what that definition essentially means. And it's something that you can study. If you go to the, one of the uh, um, top 25 MBA, Masters of Business Administration schools in the United States, if you graduate with a master's degree in business, administration or management, your starting salary will be somewhere north of $100,000 a year. In fact, I've saw, I just saw it a couple of weeks ago, they're saying that some of the starting salaries for graduates of Stanford and Harvard and Yale will be as high as 250,000 US dollars a year with a degree that just says you know how to manage people. I mean, it's crazy town, can't imagine it. But it's also something that's instinctive. There's a, there was a book, if you, again, if you ever want to get into kind of management and you're interested, there's a book uh, that a guy named Jim Collins wrote called Good to Great. I'd highly recommend it. There's a number of principles he has in there, but one of the best management principles I've ever, ever heard, he said, when you hire somebody, he made this, this is a metaphor, he said that you want to get the right people on the bus. And then when you have them on the bus, you want to make sure they're in the right seat. Because just having them on the bus isn't enough. You, you, might be, you might be able to hire someone well, but if, they, if they're sitting in the wrong seat and they're doing the wrong job, not only will they frustrate you, but they'll frustrate everyone they work with. And so if you want, that's a great book. So it's called Good to Great by, by Jim Collins. But that's an instinctive response to the management question. So management leadership, there's all sorts of examples of this, but I just, I'll give you one from the Old Testament and one from the New. Um, the best one that, that I think that is uh, helpful for us is the one of Joseph. So Joseph, ha again, has this dream about, you know, the, the time of, of, heart, of plenty and the time of, of famine, and, and he devises a plan. So he builds silos, and he, and, he, and he puts all the grain that they harvest over the seven-year period of time, and he, and he stores it. And that simple act saved humanity from complete starvation. The, the, the world would have been wiped out had Joseph not had a management strategy to prepare for famine. That was all about, it was about leadership. It was about management. In the New Testament, um, again, one of my favorite passages comes from Acts chapter 6. You know, the church is growing exponentially. All these great things are happening. Um, but there were some things that were not getting done. And what was not getting done was the, you know, the feeding of the, of the women who were outside of the, the spiritual um, responsibilities of the church. So they divided those two, right? So they, they, they said, someone needs to, to lead the, the church spiritually, but someone needs to manage the church. We need to develop a food bank, essentially. And they did that. So they split the responsibilities. That was a management decision. And then they were able to put all the food in the right place so that all the women who were not getting fed got fed. And, there, and it says that in the result, as a result of that management decision, the church even grew faster. So there's a connection between your ability to manage your enterprise and the health of the church. And, you know, I, I, I always, this is, if there's any theologians, I probably, this is probably heresy, but, but uh, I'll say it anyways. So here's my view on that, is that I think, I think good theology may save your soul, but it's not going to save the church. It's going to be good leadership, good managers. And in, in this chapter, this, these verses out of Acts 6 are a good example of, of being able to manage the changes that take place in the context of God's work in the world. So leadership. Leadership, definition, by your example, the ability to gain confidence and commitment to common objectives. Confidence, commitment, 
common objectives. That's what leadership's about, it seems to me. It's not about authority. It's not about command and control. It's not about forcing people to do something that you want done. It's about gaining the confidence of your team to a common commitment, to a common objective. And if you think about the, the things that you're involved in, that if, they, if your staff or your team has confidence in you, they'll do almost anything you ask them to do. And that's not manipulation. That's saying that they believe what you're asking of them. But that doesn't happen unless you lead by example. You've got to set the example so that they will know what direction to go in. Again, it's a, it can be studied. Um, I've actually, so Wheaton College, were, were, so I, I, worked, I taught at Wheaton for 25 years, and I, I, I was sort of retired in 2019, and I just got recommissioned, like an old ship. They, they, they started a new program, the master's degree in leadership, and uh, they asked me to come back and teach some of the classes. So I, I feel like, I feel like, like I said, like, a, like a, an old ship that got recommissioned. But I brought some brochures. So if you want to just grab one, they're, they're, this, this is going to be a program that's going to be run in uh, Europe, uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, half of it will be in, at Malavica and JV. And a quarter of it will be on the Wheaton College campus. And the other quarter will be kind of online, Zoom, hybrid sort of, sort of thing. Um, and it's, uh, lot, not, not, it's not all paid for, but in scholarships, but a lot of it is scholarshiped, including uh, travel to the United States three times in the three years that you would do the program. So if you're interested in studying global leadership, um, Wheaton is starting this program. They actually started it a year ago, and they had uh, 20 students sign up. They're kind of part-time, but they're still 20 students. But this fall, they're hoping to have another 20. And actually, actually, the first class that will be taught in this program will actually be done in the Czech Republic the last week in October. So if you're interested, you can inquire. There's a woman by the name of Wendy Larson. She'll help you through the application process. So um, leadership is an academic endeavor. You can study it. But again, it's also instinctive. And I'll just make this comment about the, the instinctive part. Um, you know, Paul lists leadership as a spiritual gift. And I've heard, you know, over the years, people say, well, I don't have, that, I don't have the gift of leadership, so therefore that allows me to opt out of ever leading a team or an organization. And my response to that was always, well, do you have the gift of preaching? Well, no. Well, do, you, do you preach every? Yeah, well, I preach every Sunday, but I mean, it's not my gift. Or do you have the gift of evangelism? And they say, well, well no. But I said, well, do you evangelize? Well, well, of course we do. And, and my point is, is that is that there is a it was, actually Will Creek did the study. Will Creek did a study and found out that roughly of any congregation of believers that gather together on a regular basis. So it wouldn't be us because we only do this once a year. But if, if you were in a, in a context where you gather with other believers regularly, all the gifts would be present, all the spiritual gifts, and leadership would be about 10%. So if it was 100 people in a church congregation, let's say, or a nonprofit organization or any, any kind of organization, it's all Christians, about 10% or about 10 of the 100 would have the spiritual gift of leadership. Doesn't mean the other 90 shouldn't lead. It just means that they have that sort of instinctive gift that, that God has given to them. So keep that in mind if you ever want to stay away from leadership. You might, hit, you might be called on to do it, even though you don't have that gift necessarily. So leadership in the scriptures, you know, again, all of our stories we heard from the time we, we grew up in a Christian home was the first story we heard, the story of David and Goliath. You know, David, by his example, confronts the greatest warrior on earth. And he says, you know, my God's better than the greatest warrior. And I'll prove that my God is better or bigger and stronger by challenging uh, Goliath to a, to a fight. And we know how that fight ends up. In uh, John chapter 13, this is the beginning of the last, you know, the last days of Jesus' life before he's uh, arrested and crucified. And it uh, starts in John chapter 13, and Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. And, and there's so much in that story. It, 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 it's kind of like this morning, if you were listening to Peter Williams, you know, there's so much in that story of, of uh, the two sons, not the prodigal son. I mean, it keeps, I'm used to hearing about the prodigal son, but I think he was right. It's the story of two sons. 
Um, there's a lot to the story of how he's washing the feet, but, but we take Roy, the, the basic idea, the simple idea, is he wants his disciples to go out in the world and make disciples. And the way you do that is you do it by example, by serving others, not, not by you know, creating a group of people that will serve you. So leadership versus management. You can assign a management position or title, but leadership cannot be assigned. Leadership must be earned from within an organization. The two are related, but they're not the same. Leadership must be earned within an organization. It's not something that can be assigned. Maybe you've been in a situation where someone who's elevated to a leader position because they were like uh, Aaron and Moses. He was just close to the, you know, to the cradle of power. They never earned it, but they maybe knew somebody who knew somebody, and maybe they're related somehow. Those are typically not very effective leaders. You know, leadership usually, it, it, there's, there's a saying that we have in the United States called, you know, the cream rises to the top. You know, good leaders tend to emerge naturally. So ideally, you would like your managers to be good leaders, but your leaders must be good managers. Again, every, every manager doesn't have to be a good leader, but I like leaders who can also manage. They tend to be the most effective. Peter Drucker um, is considered the father of modern management theory worldwide. Interestingly enough, he uh, actually was born in Austria, immigrated to the United States, and in his study of management became a believer. Crazy, you can manage that? Um, but he said this, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. And it's a small nuance, but it's important for us to just make that, try to make that distinction in your mind that, that as a manager, I want to do things the way that creates the best possible outcome, getting the right person on the bus and then in the right seat. Whereas the person who is the leader, we're doing the right things, which we're going to talk a little bit about just, just now. Um, it gets back to my, my earlier uh, analogy or metaphor. You know, do the little things well, then the big things kind of take care of themselves. Finding my last little kind of cartoon here. Um, the leader says, let's do it. The manager says, go and do it. So the leader says, he says, I see where I want to go and let's get there. And the manager says, okay, I'll figure out how to put all the pieces together to get us to a place where we, we can achieve the vision that you've set for us. It's, it's kind of like if, if I were... If I were here in, in Wiesla, well, I guess, not if I am, I guess I am here, but if I was going to say, how am I going to get from here to Prague? Do I drive? Do I ride a bike? Do I take a train? Do I leave at 2 in the afternoon or 2 in, in, in the evening? Do I walk? Do I hike? Do I need to be there by a certain date? All those decisions, in some ways, are managerial decisions because you have to consider finances, you have to consider timing and how many people are involved. And, but, but the leader says, I need to get to Prague by Friday, May 27th. The manager says, great, uh, uh, how much money can we spend? How much time does it take? Who needs to go? Should we stop along the way? Um, there's all those kind of considerations. And, and the leader says, here are the things I want to do along the trip between here and, and Prague. And the manager sets the schedule. It's a process. But we'll get into that a little bit. So, so that, that's, we'll, we'll move on from this, but... Um, So, 460 million possibilities on Google on the topic of leadership. Take you 875 years to read them all. If you read one every minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, 52 weeks a year. So what I have here is my best understanding of taking all of that stuff on the internet and distilling it down into something that is useful for you today. I'm not saying this is the only way to look at it, but I think this is my best way of understanding those 460 million possibilities. So there are four characteristics that I think make an effective leader. If I'm doing leadership development, when I taught at Wheaton College, I would say um, I was an average academic, but students loved me. And the reason they loved me was because I cared about them. 
Okay, I, I try, my, my idea of, of, of the academy was how do I help this person be all that God's called them to be? I took no pride in my research, but I did a doctoral dissertation on central, central you know, Czech and, Slo and Slovakia. It was probably about average, but, but, I, but, but people read it because it, 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 uh, it was simple. If you wanna be a good leader, this is what you gotta do. If you wanna develop leaders, I think these are the four things you need to be able to do this, or four things. So four things, for number, for number one, vision. So what is vision? It's the ability to imagine or create the unseen. It's the destination we choose and the plan to pursue. It, it's it, the, the best definition I've ever heard of, of, of vision is, is to say, you know, where, do I, where do I wanna go and how do I get there? What's the destination? Oftentimes uh, people kind of use mission and vision differently. You know, to me, mission, if you're writing a mission statement, you, you, you write it this way, you'd say something like, our organization exists for the purpose of, it's sort of the big why, and vision is, is where I wanna go with it. So, so vision is about the destination. One of the best stories I can tell you about vision is Boeing, a big you know, airline manufacturer in the United States, um, was manufacturing air, airplanes and they were trying to improve their management or their efficiency of building airplanes. Um, and so what they did was um, they, they divided uh, two groups, two test groups, uh, two groups of people who build these massive uh, jet airliners. And group A uh, were members who were simply told, uh, so simple, uh, who simply did what they were told. You know, you, you build a steering mechanism and you build the air avionics and you build the engines and, and they just, okay, they just would work on their particular project. So if you were in charge of the radar system, that's the only thing that you worked on. You didn't care what happened with the engines and the seating and the combustion and the storage and all that kind of stuff. You only focused on the, on the navigation system. And then group B is they were taken to an engineering lab and shown how their particular contribution um, was critical to the assembly of the entire airline. So they connected the radar systems to the avionics to the to the uh, safety protocols, to the, the experience of the passenger, to the engines that were being manufactured and the, and the tires that would go on the bottom of, a, of an airplane. And what they discovered, <clears throat> without any additional incentives, Group B's productivity soared because they felt they were part of a vision. They weren't just building a radar system. Now they were building a jetliner that would take people around the world. And when they caught that vision, and they saw how their contribution added to the entire production of the airline. Productivity went up, um, quality control went up, everything improved of building of that, of that airline. Vision of scripture, you know, I'm sure you've probably seen this if, if you've done any study in this area, Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. If we don't know where we're gonna go, we'll die. My, my daughter uh, and her family lived in Switzerland. They just moved to Tucson, Arizona. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a desert before, but it is, I've, I've never seen it. My brother was there a few years. In Tucson? Yeah. Oh my gosh, we gotta talk. My, he's a pastor down there at a church in, in, in Tucson. Well, the desert is deadly. There, there's no grass in the southern part of Arizona other than on the golf course. And even that's a little brown. But the desert is deadly. The desert is deadly. And if, if, if you think you're gonna you know, sneak across the border of the United States and, and walk through the desert to get in the United States, if you're from some of the, the southern countries, you'll die. And, and if, if, if you don't have a vision of how you're gonna get to Tucson or wherever it is that you're gonna get to, if you get stuck in the desert, you have no hope, you will perish. Uh, Matthew 4 in, in the New Testament, Jesus walked by the wayside beside the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I can't help but believe that if Jesus said to, to, to uh, Peter and his brother Andrew, hey, we're going to go evangelize. We're going to see all we're going to see all these heathens come in faith. Uh, we're we're going to pull people out of the synagogues. And, and they're all going to die for their for the for, once, once we get them converted, they're all going to die. They're all going to get crucified. I don't think that would be the vision that, that uh, they would have embraced. But Jesus captured their attention by put, giving them a vision of something they were familiar with. 
we're going we're gonna to fish for men. We're going to see people come to believe that I am who I claim to be. So how do you make a vision? So I, normally I wouldn't put, I've just put this, this one in recently because I thought it, because people have always asked in the past, well, okay, that's all great, but how do you actually do that? So I have what I call the SWOT analysis. Have you ever heard of the SWOT analysis? SW, okay, I think that's wrong. <laughs> Not like I know anything, believe me. I, 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 I'm sure I'm dead wrong on this, but, but the way I look at it is if I were constructing a, a vision, I want to kind of know where I'm at right now, and what I want to know is, you know, what are my strengths? I want to know what my limitations are, not my weaknesses. Because if I'm weak at something, it implies I can't, I can't like, get through it. But there may be some limitations to what I want to do. It may be resources. It may be, you know, if I said I, if I, said I wanted to play basketball in, in the National Basketball Association, uh, I'm not weak because I'm 5'8". I'm limited because I'm 5'8". It's a big difference. So I do a slot analysis, not a SWOT analysis. So anyways, then I want to know my opportunities are, what my threats are. And then once I know kind of where I'm at, then I want to know, you know, what, where's my destination? Where am I going to go? What's the point that I'm reaching for? How am I going to get from Visla to Prague? What's my expected outcome? And then the strategic plan is the action steps, the programs, the strategies which will be used by God will help me achieve my expected outcomes. This is a vision. This is, a, this is how you construct a vision. And you can do this for your own life. You, you can do this, you could actually do this daily. How do I feel today? What would I like to get done today? How do I get that accomplished? I mean, I, I, in some ways we do this, even instinctively, I mean, sort of subconsciously. But in my, I mean, the way that I kind of do it in my own life is like every year, like in January, it's always kind of a slow time in Chicago, you know, because it's snowing and it's cold and the wind's blowing and no one wants to go outside and you never see your neighbors in January. It's like you're living in the North Pole. And, um, but I do this. So I, said, I said, you know, where am I today? What, what are my strengths? What are some of my limitations? You know, as you age, one of the things that happens is, you, you, like I used, I'm, a, I'm a skier and a runner. I do all that sort of stuff. Well, you know what? I used to run five out of seven days, six out of seven days. When it's dead in the summertime, when it's hot in Chicago, it's humid, we used to go out and run like crazy. Well, now I can't. So I say, you know what? So I'm not going to run five days a week because my body can't take it. But maybe I only run three days a week. Not a weakness. I can't stop the clock. I'm not weaker. I'm not a weaker runner than I was 20 years ago. But I'm limited by age. And so, so you make that assessment of where you're at today. And then you say, where do I want to be by the end of the year? You know, if you use the physical, you know, example, you know, well, I'd like to be at a certain weight. I'd like to, you know, accomplish a certain number of steps per day, or, um, you know, I'd like to do a triathlon or whatever the case may be. And then you decide, how do I, how do I, what do I need to do in order to make sure that those things can be achieved? Well, if I want to do a triathlon in the summertime, I know that I've got to run, bike, and swim, you know, five out of seven days. And then what am I going to do? And that's what a vision, that, that's how you cast a vision. And by the way, again, again, this is not this is not necessarily instinctive, right? This is something you can teach yourself. So what I develop when I, when I try to develop leaders, as I said, you know, my Wheaton College students, you know, I don't look to see if they have the gift of the spiritual gift of leadership. What I'm looking to see is it can I help them build a vision for their life. That's why they like me, and I was a good, I was an easy grader. Um, <clears throat> second one, communication, and this gets to your point about about you know words are important. So interpersonal communication takes most of our daily activities. 70% of our awake hours are spent in communication. So if you sleep eight hours a day, that means you've got 16 hours a day that you're, that you're awake. 70% of that 16 hours is spent in communication. And that breaks down this way. You're either 45% of the time you're listening, 30% of the time you're talking, for most of us, 16% of the time you're reading, and 9% of the time you're writing. That's how you break down that, that 70%. And it seems to me that if 70% of your waking hours are, are in communication, I gotta, I've got to be a good writer. I've got to be a good listener. I've got to choose my words well when I say things. And I, 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 I was just in a, in a board meeting a couple weeks ago, and I... And I and I, I lost the discipline of, of being an effective communicator. I said something to a friend of mine 
for 20 years, I said a really unkind thing. I haven't talked to him since. I did write him last night an email, though, because I was convicted of my, my words. But, but, but why would you not want to be a good communicator? You know, my wife and I, we get along great when we're apart. <laughs> we're not communicating. We're not, when, we, when we're together, we have to work at our communication because the words are imprecise. And I don't want to say things. You know, I, I've said things that I shouldn't say. And she hasn't said things that she shouldn't say, but I say it a lot. Um, so, so this is something I can work at. I can become a better reader. I can become a better writer. You become a better... The communication to me is, is like, so I'm not a golfer, but, but I use this metaphor, is that communication is like playing golf. The more you do it, the better you get. So you need to put yourself in a place where you have to write. You need to put yourself in a place where you have to read. You need to put yourself in a place where you have to talk and learn to express yourself clearly. Communication scripture, Genesis chapter 3, um, the man and his wife. This goes right from the beginning. This, this, by the way, this is, this is one of the most incredible passages. If, if, you, if Pete Williams was in here, he'd probably take an hour on this one, one verse. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Do you realize that's the first question that God asks us? Where are you? It's the very first question in all Scripture. It's the very first time that God speaks to Adam and Eve. Where are you? It's the first question. To be a good communicator means you ask good questions. You're curious. Have you ever been in a conversation? Van Dyke asked me a call. Asked me a call my day went. My day, my day was great. How was your day? Oh, let me tell you how my day. I didn't finish. Let me, uh, and what else did you do today? No, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I did tell you that I had breakfast with so and so, uh, and and but uh, oh, and wonderful. See, last week I, I went to the wonderful thing I did last week. That's how most people are, aren't they? I mean, and doesn't that drive you crazy? You know, when you're in a conversation with someone, all, it's always about them. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that asks the question. Tell me about your day. What did you do yesterday? Who did you talk to? What did you learn in the session this morning? What, what did Pete Williams say that really struck you? That's what a good, a good communicator is, a good listener, a good question answer. Okay, then from Acts, uh, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, this gets your, your point, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. You lead by example but that doesn't mean that you're void of words. You've got to be a good, you've got to, you've got to pick your words well. Develop your vocabulary. One of the things that I did, I started doing probably, well, I'll tell you exactly what year it was. It was 19, 1993. I can't remember, it's the summer. It was the summer of 1993, that's all I can remember. I started doing the crosser puzzle. You know the crosser puzzle? Because I wanted to develop my vocabulary. And I wasn't going to pick up a dictionary and start thumbing through it. So I started doing crosser puzzles and my vocabulary expanded. So communication is something we can learn. It's not something that we have to, you know, and there are people who have the gift of communication. I, I've got a partner who's one of the best communicators I've ever met. But for the rest of us, we can develop that skill. The quality of our family, cohesiveness, friendships, relationships, effectiveness at work are in large part dependent on your ability to communicate. Most people are not good listeners. 75% of verbal communication is either misunderstood or quickly forgotten. There's been all sorts of studies done on this, and um, it's something like that you forget what you heard within the first 10 seconds or 18 seconds after hearing it. And that's because we're not very good listeners. Uh, rarely do we listen fully, rarely do listeners fully grasp deeper meanings. External noise distracts us from what we are listening to, um, I'll make this last point because it's really important. Listening is the closest thing to loving. Listening is the closest thing to loving. If I want to show love to my wife, I listen to her. 
if you, want to, if you want to demonstrate to your team that you care about them, you listen. Because you're demonstrating love. Listening is the closest thing there is to love. Funny, this is my unfunny Norwegian humor. What if, and I know this sounds kooky, we communicated with our employees? Every survey that I've ever se seen of companies that struggle internally with their management structure and processes is because the, the staff will say they never communicate with us. All right, let me get to these. Self-awareness. Self-awareness is the first action required, requirement of leadership. Constant reshaping, refocusing, never really being satisfied. And <clears throat> Peter Drucker, for me, this was one of my highest values, this self-awareness. I, I want to kind of know how I'm wired because if I understand who I am, um, I probably can understand who you are better and I'll know how to communicate with you in a language that you understand. But I've got to know myself before I can be an effective leader. I've got to know what I'm good at. I, I need to know what my limitations are. Uh, Self-awareness in the scripture, this is one of my all-time favorites from Job. Uh, though, he sl though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will defend my ways to his face. Job was had such a high degree of self-awareness. He was willing to, to go face to face with God Almighty and say, I'm not guilty. That's self-awareness. And then in the uh, New Testament, you know, this is a famous, we've all seen this all of our lives, where Paul says, you know, I don't know why I'm a slave to sin. I don't know why I do what I do, and I don't know why I don't do what I should be doing. Why is that? Well, uh, I don't know why that was for Paul. Um, I don't even know why it is for me. But I know that that's a, that's a statement of trying to understand who he is. Okay, finally, so we, we went through the first three, right? There's vision, communication, self-awareness. The, the last one is integrity. Integrity is a pattern of behavior. It's the way in which we live out what we say we believe to be true. Who, who, who is the great reformer? Who is the person that brought the Reformation into being? Most people say Luther. So most people say Luther. But is that true or false? It's false. If you're a church historian, you probably disagree with me. But I believe that the Reformation really started 100 years earlier with Jan Hus. Right? Jan Hus was burned at the stake. And why was he? Because he went to the hierarchy and said, you know what, we really had to live out what we say we believe to be true. And this, the power structure didn't like the idea of integrity, of living out what you say you believe to be true. And he took Jan, dunked him in oil, lit him on fire. Misleaders don't like integrity because if you live a life of integrity, you'll expect them to do so. But oftentimes, the influence that we try, or the control that we try to exert over people requires us to be disingenuous and lacking in integrity. Pietism, that's what this is. We say integrity, we say character. It's really pietism. And, and where did pietism start? We're, we're like within, what, 100 miles of where all this began. I've always kind of felt that this part of the world was like holy ground. You know that story about Moses, you know, with the burning bush, takes off his sandals, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground? I feel like that's where we are right here. This is, this is, where, this is where it began. We're fortunate that we can actually have a meeting like this on holy land. I'm not going to take off my sandals, though. Uh, Os Guinness said this, the inner form that makes anyone or anything what it is, whether a person, a wine, or a historical period, it is the essence of stuff he or she is made of, the inner reality in which thoughts, speech, decisions, behavior, and relations are rooted. Integrity in Scripture, uh, we're, we're going to really run. i, I got to go through this one verse, though. This is one of my all-time favorites, even the, over above the Job passage. 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul is writing to Timothy, the young pastor. He's, he's doing leadership development. I'm not sure that, that Timothy had a spiritual gift of leadership, but Timothy was Paul's guy. And he says this to, to Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely, persevere in them, because if you do, if you, again, if your life, action, and your doctrine, belief, are aligned, okay, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You want to uh, you, you uh, be a good evangelist? You want to see Europe revived, recaptured for the church? 
Paul tells to Timothy, watch what you do and what you say, or what you believe and what you say, or what you do, because if you do, not only is your life saved, but the people who hear you, their lives will be saved. I've got a good friend who has the gift of evangelism. He's, he, he can't go anywhere without sharing his faith. And we always argue about that. I say, you know what, I want to be, I want to be Timothy. I want my doctrine and my behavior closely aligned. Because I know that if they are, not only will my life be saved, but the people who hear me, who, 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 the people I communicate with. And I think what he's talking about here is I think he's the people he's in his, in his community, they will be saved as well. Uh, James, you know, again, this is the whole idea. He makes a big deal of, this, of making this, making sure our deeds and our, our beliefs are aligned. Um, I find it interesting that Luther, you know, wanted James's letter out of the Bible. Maybe I wonder if there was a little jealousy in. Yeah, who knows? I doubt it. Um, so why leadership development? I'll, I'll close with this then. Um, this is a quote from T.S. Eliot. It's one of my all-time favorite quotes. Uh, T.S. Eliot was actually born in St. Louis, but considered himself British. Lived in the UK most of his life. He's a poet. He was a writer. He was a cultural anthropologist. And he said this: "There's a shadow that exists between conception and creation." What he says there is that uh, I may have a vision of where I want to go. I may be in a, in a situation where I have to lead the team. I, I have a destination of mine. But there's a shadow that exists between that idea and that idea becoming reality. And what a leader does is a leader shines light into the shadow and clears up the fog and the mist goes away so that the team can get from where they're at to where they need to go. And that's what leadership's about. So when you find yourself in a, in a leadership role, um, remember this quote. There's a shadow that exists between conception and creation. And the leader shines light into the shadow, which builds confidence and commitment to common objectives. That's what leadership's about. That, to me, is the essence of what it means to develop leaders and develop your own leadership.